Let's talk Warhammer 40k errors and blunders with a roundup of 10 tactical or silly mistakes to avoid making in game. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today I thought we'd talk through a few rules errors and silly mistakes that might be kind of common in 10th edition. Maybe just be an interesting lens to talk through a few areas of in game tactics and common pitfalls to newer players in Warhammer 40k. In this video, I thought we'd talk through 10 fairly common examples where players might mess up and talking through ways that you might want to try and avoid them. I'm sure there's loads more like this, so feel free to let me know any other tactical errors or blunders that you see people making quite a bit down in the comments below. First up, one thing that people probably should be doing a little bit more in 10th edition 40k is making sure that all their big models are basically getting cover practically all the time. Games Workshop did write cover saves in 10th edition to perhaps be weirdly easy to get. There's quite a lot of terrain pieces that only needs to have part of the model obscured to one model in the enemy unit and your entire model gets a cover save. Ruins in particular work that way and everything from battlefield debris, hills and steel buildings and things, they can also grant cover as well, provided at least part of your models obscured behind them. This does mean that provided you're at least somewhat close to a terrain piece, it's really very easy to get a cover save for big models at least, even if they're kind of right out in the open, if you can just manage to tuck part of their base, part of a claw, or the edge of a tank only just behind a ruin, then provided the opponent can't move round and see your entire vehicle or monster, then you'll be getting cover saves against their attacks. Plus one to a saving throw isn't always game changing, but often it can be, particularly if you're being attacked by something really quite nasty that's AP minus one. Say for example, an Imperial Knight's rapid fire battle cannon, if you can be saving on twos or threes against that, then you're in for a good time. Perhaps another mistake might be missing opportunities to screen and block movement to enemy units. Screening in 40k 10th edition perhaps isn't always necessary, but sometimes you certainly can do it to devastating effects. I feel like it might be a little bit more relevant for deep strike screening than it might have been in 8th edition, with really quite a lot of things enjoying using strategic reserves, deep strike, or other teleportation type mechanics to try and get their units in a scary position. Rapid ingress might still be a big challenge to handle. Usually that's going to near enough guarantee that your opponent's unit gets somewhere kind of nice, but at least for deep strikes coming down in the enemy turn, unless your army is super elite, it's often possible to zone out huge sections of the board just by spreading out a couple of squads fairly maximally and then getting a big 9 inch denial radius around them. Usually against most armies you don't really need to worry too much on turn 1, but then if you can just shift a few units around that are in your firebase or moving along the flanks, then just measure out the 9 inches towards the table edges and particularly in the board corners if you've got a unit there. If you can make sure that you've got a unit that's within 9 inches of the corner, they'll screen out that entire area of the board. Can just mean that some opposing units that were banking on jumping into your deployment zone to retrieve some teleport homers or get behind enemy lines or something might need to drop elsewhere on the front line. Well, on screening things, I certainly bear in mind that you can move block enemy monsters and vehicles. Big things that don't have fly and have big bases can often have real trouble getting in between terrain pieces and keeping out outside the exclusion zone of 1 inches from your own models. If you've got some chaff or expendable units on the front lines, it could literally be worth their entire lives just to stand between two ruins and stop a massive enemy threat from getting into grips with the rest of your army. Holding up an entire squadron of dreadnoughts for a turn could well be worth it for the sacrifice. Another thing that's a bit more relevant in 10th edition is getting caught out by data sheet abilities. Maybe this isn't really a mistake as such, but you should probably try and discuss what units can do before the game happens. And I feel like in 10th edition there's perhaps even more gotcha mechanics than there were in 9th edition, even if in 9th edition they were kind of more obfuscated by hiding behind a million other useless stratagems. The ones in 10th often can be massively powerful though, things like fights in death, shoot in death, return fire stratagems where you can immediately shoot back the unit that just shot you and reactive movement type things like Eldar Phantasm or Tyranid Termagants backpedalling away from the enemy could be really disruptive as well, say hiding from line of sight or shielding themselves from charges by being too far away. I guess this might be just one to try and bear in mind to have a quick chat with your opponent about what their units can do as the game goes on, unless you just want to go into things blind just for fun of course. Realistically, just about no one's going to be able to keep every unit from the 26-ish factions in the game in their head, and there are likely to be a ton of units or options like stratagems that you just don't know very well, and that's probably only going to increase more when the codexes come out with lots of detachments to add more stuff to the confusion. I think before the game, when you're talking through armies, it might just be a good idea to ask about abilities that can act in your turn, things like reactive movements, or surprise shooting or fighting. They're probably some of the most important things to know about, and some of the bigger gotchas in the game, maybe. On a similar kind of thought for that, getting your models killed on your turn is generally a mistake. 
That's kind of obvious, but there are a surprising amount of ways that you could manage to do it, a few of which are listed here. Overcommitting to charges could be pretty dangerous, say if you've got a scary melee unit and you want to harness every bit of their damage output, you might be tempted to charge two things. If any of them are any good in melee, you probably better hope that you can kill at least a fair bunch of them so they don't just wipe you out back in your own turn. The ultimate own goal would be to charge something, kill some of them, and then have them just completely wipe you out, and then have the unit go and be completely free to destroy more enemies in the enemy turn. As well as being overambitious with things like charges, and bear in mind how badly a fight's first unit could damage your unit if you charge them, sometimes it's just not going to be worth it to take the risk. Or say charging two different things in different places on the board, that could put you at risk of a massive enemy interrupt that interrupts and destroys the enemy unit. Otherwise, enemy data sheet abilities, as we just said. Overwatch is a particularly big one now, particularly as it can trigger with any movement within 24 inches. You could have massive units taking chunks out of your fragile ones. Might just be worth bearing in mind the risk of what the opponent can do with Overwatch each time you move. Could be a game of cat and mouse, depending on when they decide to use their Overwatch stratagem, or if they think that you might have to move something else and give them a better target later in the movement phase. Can still also be really big when deep striking or charging as well, particularly with things that auto hit like flamers or things that have sustained or lethal hits on their shooting attacks. Finally, things like risky psychic abilities or hazardous roles could just not be worth dealing with in certain circumstances. A lot of the time, the risk is probably worth the payoff, but say if you've just got a hell blaster or two holding down a vital objective, having them go overcharged with a gun could be kind of fun. But if you take your 1 in 6 chance of just losing the objective and maybe the game as a result, it might not be the best idea. Overcharging plasma is pretty fun though, and I would bear that in mind as well. Something to look out for in the shooting phase is if you might have the potential of shooting a very key model out of a massive easy charge. It's not always the biggest consideration in the world, but say if you had an enormous melee character like Mortarian bearing down on some space marines, if he's got a sort of long charge to make already, it might genuinely be not worth doing any firepower into the unit or making use of his psychic attacks, as if he kills one or two of them it might make the charge massively longer, and he might have just killed one or two space marines but at the cost of letting the rest of the squad live. It's perhaps most easily done on things like 9 inch deep strike charges. I think ideally, if you're dropping any units to deep strike and charge, if they've got both guns and combat weapons, then probably try and have a target that they can shoot and then a target that they can charge, or have them set up in such a way that your opponent would have to take a whole load of casualties before the charge range got longer by being in 9 inch range of multiple different models with your unit. Sometimes just completely holding fire could be the right choice. Ideally, you'd be able to fire at something but hopefully not just something that's going to kill one model and leave the rest of the squad safe from your glorious melee combat. The next one is definitely one that I've done far too often, not bothering to pre-measure quite crucial distances when you're trying to get to objectives, or occasionally to try and see if you can make a charge on an enemy unit kind of safely. You have to think about quite a lot when you're positioning units in Warhammer 40k, what things they can see and whether they can get cover, and whether or not they can escape being from in line of sight of certain scary enemy stuff. But for overall winning the game, it is going to make sense to have your units being able to get onto objectives. A lot of Warhammer 40k is fighting over midfield objectives, moving your own units onto it and trying to fight the enemies that were there, and then probably having the opponent counter-attack you in turn. Definitely in deployment, it's worth thinking about. If you go first, then will you be able to reach the objective that you want your unit to? And I would absolutely pre-measure it for if it's a long-range unit to be able to definitely get onto it without an advance roll. And if it's a unit that's probably going to need to advance to get there, try and make sure that, that advance roll is a pretty doable number and you don't just need something like a 6. Could also be very relevant if you're trying to get enemy units in range. Say if your opponent's deployed a unit, then you can put down your unit and literally pre-measure to see whether it would have the distance to get range on that unit when you put it down. Probably better than just eyeballing it if it's going to be close. You don't really want an inch or two of bad positioning to spoil you getting range on your big guns or getting line of sight. For the objectives thing, it's probably worth doing similar with the second line waiting to move up to the objectives. You might be putting some units on midfield objectives and then having certain units move up to try and form the second line to take them if any of your units get killed, which they might do against most armies. Even if it means they might be a little bit suboptimally positioned, it's probably worth having them have the option to be able to get to the points and try and make sure that your opponent's not scoring them and you are. As a follow-on for getting your units killed in your own turn, resolving combats in the wrong order could certainly be a way to do that. In the wrong circumstances, this could be absolutely devastating, and turn a combat that should have been a big win into a massive loss instead. Say, for example, if the Space Marine player charged these two units and their opponent had command points to interrupt, you almost certainly want to resolve the combat with the Blade Guardian first, as opposed to Rebute Gilliman's combat, 
If the cultists strike first, then they're not really going to do much to him, so you may as well kill some corn berserkers first. Otherwise, if Gilliman decides to go first, then the corn berserkers might spend two CP to interrupt and happily chop up the blade guard, losing or dealing some horrendous damage to a valuable unit. Back to gunnery command once more, and another thing that newer players might get wrong a bit is splitting fire a bit too much, say just firing the guns into the nearest unit that they can see, or perhaps just choosing the single target that their unit's going to be most efficient into, as opposed to trying to do a bit of focus fire and actually make sure that you actually properly wipe out a couple of enemy threats. Usually in Warhammer 40k, fully destroying units is really quite a lot more valuable than just damaging several. The opponent might get bracketed, they might have a bit less damage output due to slain models, and they might fail Battleshock potentially, but even small units can be really quite disruptive, screening things, taking objectives, and in particular for bigger models like these Lehman Russes, if you just damage a whole bunch of them but don't actually kill any of them, they're all going to be firing back at full capacity next turn, whereas if you just decided to focus fire and put all your damage into one of them, it might well have died and save you some return fire. There's definitely a big temptation in Warhammer 40k when the opponent's only got one or two wounds left to not really dedicate much damage into them, Ideally, if you've got a few stray shots here and there to plink off the last wound or two, that'd be ideal. But if, say, your opponent's just got a few wounds left on one key unit, and you've got a really big unit with tons of guns to fire, it's probably worth adding in a few more shots for redundancy on the depleted enemy units. Give yourself a super high chance of actually wiping it out, as opposed to a bit of a coin flip chance as to whether or not it lives or dies. Obviously you wouldn't want to go too far the other way, as overkill isn't particularly great either. That's also going to lead to less dead enemies overall. So ideally you don't want to be ploughing, say, an entire night's worth of firepower all into one tank with a wound or two left. It is kind of a balance, and depends on how reliably you can kill it with any one bit of shooting. Another mistake that is often tempting to make in Warhammer 40k is forgetting all about the objectives to just deal raw damage to the opponent's army. And in reality, you kind of have to balance the two throughout the entirety of the game of Warhammer 40k, both scoring at least a fair few primaries and secondaries to stay in the game and stop your opponent taking an insurmountable lead, but also trying to destroy all their main damage dealers and objective scorers as fast as possible to shut down their own options and stop them doing the same to you. I feel like at least for the most part, people tend to make mistakes on the side of going a bit too gung-ho after the enemy units, Perhaps particularly in the later game, moving up to try and shoot and engage units that just aren't really actually all that relevant anymore. Whereas if you're actually trying to go all out and deliver victory, it might actually have just been more sensible to do the boring thing and hunker down on an objective out of line of sight, rather than just risk having your valuable unit get destroyed and getting no points for the objective. I think it's usually worth having a rough idea what units are going to try and achieve what each turn. Which units are going to be moving up onto the objectives, and can they stay safe, and will they be tough enough to survive the enemy fire? What things can't you afford to expose or lose at this point? And sometimes you might have to make hard choices, per se, doing things like the action-type secondary objectives, versus having your units do damage and potentially take off valuable units off the opponent's objectives, which could be worth a lot of points in itself. Particularly as things get on towards the end of the game, it's going to skew more and more in terms of objectives being the important thing, and kills being secondary can still be helpful, certain secondaries need you to kill things, and if it destroys something that might be one of the last units that the opponent had to score something with, then again that could be a really big deal. But if you have to give up a whole load of victory points to do so, then it might not be quite so good. Finally, and a bit of a mini-game alongside the main game of Warhammer 40k, is mismanaging command points. As you go through the game, you need to tread the fine line between wasting CP on things that are far too trivial, and then not using command points early enough to influence the game early on, as big swings and boosts to the army to destroy enemy units will usually give you an advantage and start getting you a bit of a snowball effect to collapse the enemy army. I feel like knowing what a good stratagem is to use at one moment or another is something that usually just comes with experience, but in general I'd probably try and avoid doing things like very minor damage buffs, particularly command point rerolls on say hit rolls of big hitting shots. If you're going to use command rerolls to inflict damage it's probably better on wound rolls or damage rolls, though even then the return might not be all that good compared with some of the other things that you can do with them. Otherwise, not using them early enough can be a big deal, as it's not really a good idea to have, say, 5 command points left on turn 4 if most of your army's been wiped out. You probably should have been using those earlier to try and swing the game in whatever way you can. If nothing else good comes up, then using them on some more inefficient stratagems might have been better than having them on spent. In 10th edition, I'd generally say that most stratagems tend to be a bit more powerful than 9th edition, with command points being a little bit more limited a resource. Perhaps some of the best uses are big offensive, defensive, or movement buffs, ideally targeted towards the biggest and most important units in your army, 
Rerolling charges could be an absolutely massive one if it makes the difference between a unit getting in or not. That's a huge swing of loads of damage or none at all. Interrupting a melee, as we mentioned earlier, when it makes the difference between killing an enemy unit and maybe even saving yours into the bargain as well. I think that Overwatch is quite a nice one if you've got things that can do Overwatch well, particularly into more fragile enemy units, like say things like Eldar Aspect Warriors, or anything that's very elite that your unit can damage well. If you can Overwatch in such a way that it kills something that was about to deal you damage, that's pretty big. There's definitely loads of other really good stuff spread throughout the indexes of course. So anyway, hope you've enjoyed a quick discussion of a few of the mistakes that newer players might make in 10th edition 40k, though to be honest I'm sure that most experienced hobbyists are guilty of most of these at one point or another. I certainly wouldn't exclude myself in that. Feel free to let me know any other game changing mistakes that you might have made in the recent past, look forward to hearing all your thoughts, if there's enough interesting stuff I might make a part 2 video about them. If you've enjoyed the video then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming, I do tend to post new ones just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Allspets Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you'd like to help support. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.